Hello, and welcome to Regrets I've Had a Few. I'm Paul Hunter, Artistic Director of Told by an Idiot, and this is a podcast where I talk to friends and colleagues delving into what made them the person they are today. Hello, and welcome. My guest this month is a dazzling young performer who is already making a big impact. I first met him in 2019 when I cast him as Stan Laurel in the idiot production of Charlie and Stan. He captures the spirit of this iconic comic genius beautifully. We then went on to collaborate with him on two other idiot projects, our anarchic family sketch show, Get Happy, and our new film, Seven Deadly Idiots. He has recently been delighting audiences in the West End in the new Vic production of Marvellous, and I, for one, will be watching closely to see where he goes next. Welcome, Jerome Marsh-Reed. Hey! (laughs) Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for your kind words. It's always a pleasure to work with you and see your face. Well, that's it's likewise, Joe. And that wallpaper, I won't go on about that. I'm just going to say that wallpaper is, is spectacular. Um, <laughs> now, I said I'm looking closely to see where you go next. I know where you go next. You go back into Stan Laurel's trousers yeah. as we revive uh, um, uh, Charlie and Stan at Wilton's Music Hall. Um, for, it's an extraordinary venue, Wilton's. And obviously we'll talk about Charlie and Stan later in the in the episode, but for those people who don't know Wilton's musical, how would you describe it? It's it's amazing. The space of it is it's like this old musical that is managed even now in 2022, it's still managed to keep the authenticity of the space. So when you walk into it, you're kind of time traveling back into the days. And and I remember when we were talking about Charlie and Stan, people were adding comments about maybe Charlie's parents would have maybe performed there and I think they've done so well in that space to to keep it authentic and to really look after the space um I I like to climb on things when I get into the theatre uh, <laughs> and Wilton's Music Hall wasn't one of those places where you can just put your feet all over it <laughs> uh, and well, that... day, a lovely lovely bar um yeah I I just a great place and a really nice place where um, the staff are, are brilliant. And you, when you walk in there, you do feel like you're walking back in time. Well, I really, really look forward to walking back in there with you um, because I agree. That's a brilliant description of it. It, it. it is a bit like time traveling. And as you say, it's the perfect space for our show. So that's wonderful. The other thing I need to mention before we go into more detail Obviously, we're recording this the day after England managed to make it to the uh, to the. I, I can, for the listeners, I can see Jerome going mad in front of the <laughs> flowery wallpaper there. Um, so obviously, you and I are big football fans, and and football will come up in this, I'm sure. But I've got to ask you, what are, are you in? Are you fearful of France, or or what what do you think? Well, they played really well, didn't they? France yeah. played really well in their last game, and so I was. I am fearful of France. However, to see us beat Senegal so confidently, to see the talent in our team, to see the defensively, midfield and attacking, we are actually a very, very strong contender for winning this. Um, so I go into this next game with confidence and I'm going to hold on to that confidence until we go 2-0 t- down. <laughs> <laughs> I might change my tone. but Okay. <laughs> But must must say, I'm really impressed with the boys. I really think they are, they're really shining, and they look so so confident. That's what I really like to see. Um, yeah, and I watched that at ten pin bowling last night. Ah, what really, was the atmosphere like there? It was it was it was mixed. There's people playing pool. There was, <laughs> <laughs> but every time there was a goal, there was a big roar. It wasn't quite pub vibes, but it was nicer than being at home in a way. And where will you watch the quarterfinal? Well, we've decided to do some hosting next week. And ah. I didn't think that, I forgot that, you know, if we go through, it will be on that day. So I'm now tweaking my hosting plans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think there's a few people tweaking their hosting plans. It's a very good way of putting it. Um, anyway, we'll come to football because I know that's an important a passion of yours as it is mine um but let's go right back uh you were born in stafford is that right hey yes yes so, yeah, the, the, the mighty stafford not far from birmingham of course where, no. where i'm from um I, I always ask this question because i'm intrigued is can you 
Do, was there any kind of performance in your family, in your background of any sort? No, uh, not that I know of, actually. I'm the first performer in my kind of immediate family. Um, but you can feel that across all the people, they've got kind of a performer attitude, but never really pursued it. It's interesting that, isn't it? Because I... I'm one of uh, youngest of five children, so my eldest sister was had left home when I was born. So I only discovered things, you know, as you grow up. But I remember my other sister saying that Margaret, my elder sister, was very desperate to be a performer. But my parents at that time didn't think it was the right thing for her to do. And so you never know sometimes, do you, what people wanted to do or didn't do? Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, actually, that being said, you just um, reminded me, my sister did one year at college um, to try and do performing. Ah. And I think more than anything, maybe the nerves of being actually on stage yeah. and a confidence thing, uh, really, that was kind of what stopped her. Uh, but it's, it's weird because she never spoke about it, actually, when we were growing up or anything. It was kind of a little secret mission that she went on. And I think she realised that maybe it wasn't for her. Um, but yeah, you've just reminded me now that there was one person in the family that wanted to do it, but didn't quite um, pursue it. Now that's something that's interesting, and also the notion that she decided to keep it to herself. Yeah, it's quite an interesting idea that it was obviously personal, and she didn't want to necessarily reveal that. What about any early memories of going to see performance of any sort? Do you have any early memories of that? Only got one, and it was, <laughs> it, it was amazing. Uh, <laughs> We went to go see Aladdin with the school. Uh, I don't know what theatre it was. It was one of those trips on the coach. Yeah. Uh, primary school. And we got there and we saw Aladdin and it was so fun. There was toilet roll flying everywhere. It was amazing. <laughs> and one actor just forgot his lines. He was the lead actor. Um, and I think he was playing Jafar or somebody. And he forgot his lines and they pulled out a script and he started doing loads of impressions. He did some... Darth Vader impressions and all that while he was reading his script on stage <laughs> and in beautiful fashion just came straight back into it but I remember like as an adult I think watching that would kind of make my skin crawl a little bit but as a kid I loved it I was like oh yeah this is really cool it's like an added part to the show you know well that's quite interesting isn't it <laughs> that that notion that as a kid you clearly enjoyed the fact that something had gone wrong yes um and also you then enjoyed the way in which that performer dealt with it, which in a sense is something that I've always been fascinated at. Told by an idiot, we're fascinated by that, as you know, that sense of spontaneity and, yeah. and, and uh, the declaring of things. Like, you know, in Charlie and Stan, moments where, you know, we've, we've got people out of the audience to do something. And, um, and I'm always fascinated by how an audience does connect when something goes wrong. We might touch on that a bit later. So would you say when you were growing up that that, that you were it was more the football sport thing that you were into than, than performing? Yes, I'm going to out my dad at this point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yes, I wanted to play for Manchester United yeah. up until about year five. So um, how old is your five? Uh, I think I was about 10. 10, okay. Um, yeah, 10 ish. And my dad, we'd, I'd only see my dad on the weekends because my mum and dad were separated. Um, and my dad would always ask me, oh, so son, what do you want to do? And up until year five, wanted to play football for Manchester United. And he said to me one day, he said, son, are you the best in your class? And I said, no. And okay. OK, uh, well, he first asked me, are you the best in the school? I said, no. He said, are you the best in the class? I said, no. And he said, it's quite a hard thing to play for Manchester United, <laughs> especially <laughs> if you're not even the best in your class situation. And it broke me. And he said, you should think about maybe, you know, another career choice or something else. And I got really upset and really angry Uh but it was a moment of realisation. And so from that point, I decided that maybe football wasn't, I still played it, but wasn't going to be my kind of end goal. Uh, so, yeah, mainly into sports until year five when my dad crushed my dreams. 
<laughs> also, I like the fact that he, he he started by saying, "Are you the best in the school?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Um, Are you the best in the class? <laughs> and I also, I also like your honesty. I like your kind of sense that you didn't go. Yeah, I am. You kind yeah. of went, No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Dad. I'm no. Not. no, I'm not. No. <laughs> I was probably similar. I have to say, very similar to you in that I would say maybe even I was deluded for slightly longer. I think uh -huh. I, I probably clung on to it till I was about 12, thinking I would play for Aston Villa. And 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 that moment of thinking, oh, this isn't going to happen. I'm not <laughs> it's a weird one, isn't it? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm not going to play for Aston Villa. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I obviously you've met Dexter, my son, who is obsessed with football. And, and I... I, I'm not sure if I'll be following your dad's advice. When I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. Get... I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. But, <laughs> but I suppose that's my first question around regret. Do, is that did obviously at the time you're ten and it's your life and all you want to do is play football? Do you look back on that with any kind of regret, or is it just a distant kind of thing now? Uh, no, there's no regret there. It makes me laugh. Uh, more than anything, it makes me laugh. It's character building because that was uh, a hard pill to swallow, but it was a milestone in my life of going, that isn't um, the only career that I can do. Because <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? When you just think, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to yeah. do. I'm going I'm to play yeah. for Manchester United. Uh, so I don't regret it. And, and, if anything, I like bringing it up to my dad. It's one of those. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it, I, I, it's a very good story. I do like it. We've talked a bit a little when we've been together rehearsing and touring around the country and stuff. And, and I think even though we're very different generations, I, I think there's things that connect us, not just sport, but, um, you know, I think about, you talked a bit about your school and I talked a bit about mine. And I, I seem to remember when you came to see our show, uh, Would You Bet Against It? Against us, not against yeah. Um, you enjoyed the moment where I was beaten on stage. Uh, yeah. lots, of, <laughs> lots of people enjoyed that. And not least Kyle, who delivered the beating. I think he took quite a lot of pleasure in it. Yeah. But am I right in saying, without going into any details, school wasn't always the the, the, the most kind of creative or uh, of places? No, I think for me, you're yeah, yes, you are right, because uh school for me was interesting, especially high school. I started smoking when I was quite young. I kind of was in with the crowd that would kind of cause trouble, but they, they were troublemakers, but they were really good people. Yeah. Um, I must, I need to make sure that it's very clear. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and so as I got to school, my attention started to kind of flow. I stopped wanting to play for Manchester United and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I wasn't necessarily the smartest kid at most things. Um, so I just, I suppose I just messed around for a bit. And I'd always try to make people laugh in class. My my report would always be, always be, Jerome is a bright young man, but he's the biggest distraction in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad would always call me the class clown. He would say, oh, you're the class clown. Everyone's getting good grades while you're making them laugh and making school easier for everyone. And so it's quite fitting that now I get paid to be a clown, really. Uh, <laughs> because I think that's how it segued in. It was one of those. And it, was, it wasn't it was a horrible place for me to be. Um, I had a lot of friends, luckily. I, you know, I enjoyed socialising. But uh, in terms of grades and satisfaction from achieving good good grades that wasn't in there for me it's interesting the, the, the biggest distraction in the room is, is a, i should think of the title of your autobiography um, <laughs> um was there um was there a point when you started because i know there's another element we've talked about football and we've talked about performance but more specifically, I wanted to ask about dance, because dance was quite a... Was that your way into performance before acting? Yes. So uh, I remember dancing in the mirror to, like, Chris Brown and all these people and, and actually wanting to be good at it. I, I've got an embarrassing story that I'll make quite short. No, no, no. Um, I had 
I went on holiday, this kind of like haven style holiday. And uh, I entered a dance, well, I entered a talent contest and uh, <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> and so I went, we were waiting and two people before I was on, there was two amazing break dancers, the break dancers uh, and they were doing amazing in sync choreograph routine. And I was about to go on with a whole freestyle that I hadn't even worked on. Uh, so after the dancers, there was a great singer, everyone's clapping, whooping, and me and my brother, Kieran at the time, he was going to beatbox while I, while I um, started dancing. So he, uh, he starts beatboxing, I start, <laughs> I start freestyling, and I jumped in the air to do the worm, and instead of worming down, I just landed on my stomach and winded myself <laughs> <laughs> in front of this whole audience. It was like the night the talent night, and everyone's laughing. I get up and I get to them, I say, I don't want to do this anymore. And everyone's just laughing. My, my little brother's still beatboxing. And to the point I was so embarrassed, I went over and helped him with the beatboxing. And I walked back towards the table and I could see my whole family, especially my dad, crying, laughing at this point. <laughs> And it was a moment like that where I thought I either never do this again or I get really good at this. And so not long after that, I um I started a breakdancing company. Uh, I, I started going to classes and I really grafted. I used to busk with them and they and they let me join the crew, newborn crew. Um, a lot of fond memories. And that's kind of my connection with Birmingham, really, because I used to go and busk in the centre in Birmingham. Uh, and from that, uh, I have a friend, Ryan, who was an enemy at primary school, who is now my best friend, oh. which is quite cute. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you going to do in college? And I was like, I'm not too sure. I was still lost at this point. Uh, I was like, I think I might do electrical engineering because my dad does that and it, I could work with my dad maybe. And he was like, you're such a performer you because I was like make jokes or whatever it's like you should come to college with me and you have to do singing acting and dancing and I was like okay well I'll come to college but I'm not going to sing and I'm not going to act I'm just going to dance <laughs> uh, and he kind of agreed with me but obviously when I got to college that wasn't the case they had me singing and acting before I knew it uh, and that was my way in it started at a park on Meadow Road in Stafford, uh, my friend just striking the question, what are you doing? You should come and join me. And from then, the tutors were really kind of pushing me to do more acting stuff. They gave me a lead role at the end. They would always... Brilliant. They, they, they believed in me, to be honest. And so f even now, when I, you know, just done my West End debut, sending me messages, just thinking, you know, how far I've, I've managed to come since those days yeah I, I think that's I think it's amazing Jerome I really do and I know you know it's it's um it, it's really important those like you say that they that they supported you and provoked you and and you know you went wanting to dance but they provoked you into acting and singing and and those um those things go deep I was just listening on the radio this morning where they spoke to a, a coach from Birmingham City who coached Bellingham when he was seven years old and um, and this guy clearly was a big mentor, has become a big mentor for Jude Bellingham, and 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 Bellingham was talking about him after the game, and clearly, and I think those people that really shape you or provoke you become key key in your life, don't they? It's a big thing. It is. It's it's a massive thing. Those like milestones, like the day I realised I wasn't going to play for Manchester United. There was a day at college where I knew I was going to pursue more acting stuff. Uh, and it was down to the teachers, their belief in you. And I'm not saying at school no teachers believed in me, but there was a real sense of belief that you can do it. You are yeah. good enough. And that's what people need sometimes. They need to be Of course. You are worth it. It's, this isn't an investment worth pursuing. Um, and so, yeah, I that was massive. And, and do you remember a moment? Oh, yeah, no, and I... I think I touch on it in when we made Would You Bet Against Us about, you know, 
my uh, attempts to get into show business. But I, it, it, what you say strikes a real chord. So was this a BTEC course or what? what course? Yes, because I didn't get the grades at um, school, I did a level two first, which was one year to get my grades up until I could do the level three extended diploma in performing arts. Brilliant. And, and then... What was the journey from there to thinking, oh, I could go to drama school? How did that happen? My friend Rai, um, who's my best friend now, he his uncle was, is an actor. He, he's done quite a few things and he went to drama school. And so Rai was like, he was honed in on going to drama school. I didn't know anything about it, but I took a lot of um, inspiration from Rai. So I was like, oh, maybe I could go to drama school. And I got a foundation offer at East Fifth. Um, sorry, I got a foundation offer at Italia Conti, but I couldn't afford it. But luckily, my friend Rai, he could, so he managed to do that. And I was in my last year of college while he was there, so I saw what drama school life was, and I wanted it, and I wanted <laughs> that. So I did one year at uni um, because I couldn't afford the foundation offer. Uh, and then luckily I auditioned for the physical theatre course and I got in and it, it changed my life really. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I, obviously that's how ultimately how I met you was because of, of that training and, and then us looking for actors and and there's clearly something quite special that goes on in that in that course and how it's put together and the kinds of performers they bring together and and also the journey that those performers go on that was two years three years how long was that um yeah it was a three-year course yeah. and it's clever it's really well put together I must admit Simon Hunt who's the head of our physical theatre course he knows what he's doing in terms of the start of it's kind of like Krotowski which is kind of breaking down your ego and coming down to the yeah. basis of yourself. Uh, and you go through all these journeys. You do mime, you do gat, which is gymnastics, acrobatics, tumbling. You do loads of different things, puppetry, everything that's kind of on the theatre at the moment, you touch upon for a module. And so by the end, you're making work with all of these different elements. And then you go to the theatre and you see it all on stage and you think, oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that because I've trained in it. So it gives the performers the confidence to know that they can go out into the industry and do it and offer things. It's not just about the director telling you what to do. It's about thinking for yourself and giving the director options. Um, I think that I, I think that's a really, again, a really good description of of what, uh, as a director, what I perceive performers that I've met. And you're not the only one. I mean, uh, Kyle, who we worked with on. Uh, would you bet against us was was brilliant and also came from a, a year below you or two years below you a uh, year below me yeah yeah below and i think what you say about making offers and performers that are, uh, are can really collaborate i think that's clearly a key thing that which for me obviously and for tobin is exactly what we're looking for but if we come to this point where i first met you which was at the audition i read somewhere a quote where you said it might have been in a stage interview, but you said, as a British Caribbean actor, I never thought that I'd get the chance to audition for the role of Stan Laurel. So even the audition for the part was a surprise. Yeah, it really was. Um, at first, I was in, I think I was in Budapest when the tape came through um, as a birthday, uh, as a birthday treat. And I saw the role and then I looked and Lance, oh, I remember these two. I, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is great. And I thought, did they want me? Am I going to be playing Stan or did they just want to see me kind of for Stan, but maybe for other characters or whatever? Um, and I was very fresh out of drama school. I'd, just, I'd done one job before, um, but not like a theatre, theatre job. And so I was kind of just going in and just seeing what happens, but I didn't expect to even be playing style. I didn't, I didn't, I was so surprised by it. And I met the brilliant um, Steve Harper, yeah, yeah. And, who made me feel at ease straight away <laughs> and was so good at opening, uh, opening the room and allowing that space and you as well. I remember actually doing the piece that I created and you were like laughing and, and, it's, it sounds like a weird thing, but some auditions you go to, like they say they stay so stern 
even if they're, they're enjoying it. But the fact that the room was so open and free, I left that audition thinking, I actually really want to do this. Um, yeah, and what a great company kind of to kind of go into my first big job, really. Well, it was interesting because obviously, I suppose, I th and we've talked about this, but from my point of view, it was very clear to me that I had no interest in trying to find someone who looked exactly like Stan Laurel or someone who looked exactly like Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that, you know, Charlie is played by a woman, brilliantly by Danny mm. and, and previously by uh, uh, Amalia and now your, and yourself. For me, it was always about the spirit of something. Otherwise, I don't see the point. You might as well watch a documentary or see the real thing. But you had something of that playful, naive spirit that obviously is perfect for Stan. But it, it's interesting, obviously, with the, we're coming back to the show again and we've done it in lots of exciting places. And, and um, it, it, it it is that it is something that wonderfully speaks to a wide audience. This notion of what, in a sense, what you get to audition for or what you get seen for, do you think that's getting better? Do you think it's getting wider for you or does it still feel fairly narrow? I've got to admit, I do actually think it is getting better. <laughs> and I say that, I think about that a lot. Yeah, of course. When I say it, I actually mean it. I do think the things that I'm being seen for are things that I wouldn't expect to be seen for probably about four years ago. Or like coming out of drama school, not knowing am I going to be typecast. And and the stuff that I was interested in because I knew that would be what I would probably play. Yeah. So for instance, like I thought I'd be into more kind of dramas and stuff and I'm still completely interested in that I never really in drama school loved clowning really yeah. this is this very strange thing that I've gone out to do so much of it um because I didn't necessarily see myself in any of those roles or doing any of those jobs or even understanding what clowning is you have to be in a room full of clowns sometimes or people that can be silly to go wow yeah. this is work that I want to create and this is work that I want to see um it's getting better Paul I mean we've got a we've got some journey to go on still of course but I will openly say uh for myself I believe it's getting better for sure ah that's that's very interesting to hear and and also obviously you're now going on and working with loads of different uh, people in different ways and I, I, you know this because a, a gang of us came to see you I I, I thought Marvelous was a fantastic night at the theatre and and you were a part of a, you were brilliant and part of a wonderful ensemble. But I was talking to um, one of the producers from the new Vic Martin the other day on a Zoom, and I was congratulating him on the show. Uh, if people don't know it's based on the life of Neil Baldwin, a TV uh, with Toby Jones, and now brilliantly reworked for the stage. But what I thought was wonderful was it, it felt like it really captured something of the feeling of the time I think there's an innate kindness about the show and in the show and about community and and I felt when I sat in the audience that people really connected to that feeling um is that did that come across to you on stage did you have that feeling as a, as a company of actors yeah the story from Stoke to London didn't change sometimes you feel like I'm going into the West End now so I need to I need to jazz it up. We need to put a dance number in here. We need to do this, that, the other. But the story was Neil. The story was like Neil helped write the show. And because Neil is so infectious and so loving and has the most amount of friends I know anyone to have, <laughs> you are, as a performer, making friends through Neil with the audience. You know, and, and that theatre offers seats where you can sit down right next to somebody and have a little chat with them for a second you know uh it offers that and I think that is one thing I must say I think is brilliant from the new Vic from Teresa is allowing us to keep the story the Stoke Newcastle under Lyme story and take it to London and and people do say people from the Midlands are friendly and approachable yeah. and I think that's what the show is it's it's an invite to, to this story as opposed to being told you can like it or you're not, but you know it's a brilliant story. You know Neil's life is a spectacular one. I think that's a really good way of putting it, Jerome. The idea of it being an invitation 
And I think that's what theatre should be. It's not. It's something that you're inviting people to share this, to be part of this. And and actually, I, Martin was saying whether they were uh, in any way a little worried that it might feel too local as a show. But actually, the, it, it, it transcends all of that because it's very universal in what it's about, about how we look after each other, the sense of being a community, whether that's at football or in church. Or, and obviously, it's also wonderfully funny and playful. And, and I obviously, it won't surprise you, I enjoyed the theatricality of it. That, yeah. that, that really um, appealed to me. Um, uh, yeah, that was one of my great nights at the theatre this year, for sure. Now, as we draw to a close, Jerome, I, I, um, it's been really great chatting, and we will be chatting a lot more. I'll yeah. be shouting from my megaphone in there, <laughs> what are you doing on the... <laughs> <laughs> but I always end by asking seven rapid-fire questions to which you say uh, the first thing that comes into your head. So, yeah. the first question. Late night or lie-in? Late night. Uh, Jude Bellingham or Kylian Mbappe? Mbappe. <laughs> Pilates or yoga? Yoga. LA or New York? New York. Sushi or pasta? Pasta. Winning an Oscar or scoring the winning goal in the Champions League final? Oh, an Oscar. <laughs> I was I was watching you wrestle with your ten year old self. Uh, and finally, parkour or bungee jumping? Parkour. Jerome, it's been lovely seeing uh, you. Have a great day, mate, and uh, I'll see you in rehearsal. Thank you, mate. Amazing to speak to you. All the best. Cheers, Jerome. All see right. you, mate. Okay, mate. Bye. Dear listeners, if you've enjoyed this idiot podcast, please spread the word.